You've tuned into the right place. This is the Four Points Broadcast with Dr. Cindy Trim. Come on, you can make some noise for Jesus. You're in the right place because we've been praying for you and we believe that God has a word specifically for you. And as we were praying tonight, I just saw many of you have been tossed by the waves of culture, of the economy, of of life. What has life thrown at you? What have you been tossed by? But I believe tonight's broadcast is going to be like that that lighthouse on the shore that's going to direct you back into line with God's purpose for your life, for you to reconnect to the DNA of your destiny. That's what we're talking about in this new series. It's the DNA of destiny, and if you missed the last uh, uh, couple of messages, you want to go back and watch On Demand. Download that Cindy Trim Ministries app now so that you can watch On Demand all of the past messages and stay up to date. We want you to continue to share these messages so that you too can be a part of spreading that light around the world. 20 nations are online right now. I I speak a blessing to those watching from Africa, from England, from, from all across the world, Switzerland. Switzerland even logs on. I've seen people from Alaska, and one time we had someone from Antarctica. It's kind of strange, but we welcome you two. We're touching the globe, the four corners. That's what the Four Points broadcast is about. If you're hashtagging any of the statements tonight, use hashtag Destiny DNA. We want to hear what God is speaking to you while Dr. Trim is teaching. Well, we want to bring her right to the stage. We want you to give a warm welcome to Dr. Cindy Trim. Well, praise the Lord. We are so excited to have an opportunity to do life with you. And tonight of all nights, and whether you are tuning in tonight or it may be morning in other parts of the world or evening in some other parts of the world, we want you to know that we are here to do life with you, to pray for you, and to really begin to believe that God is moving in your life and that believing with you and standing with you by faith, you will be able to fulfill God's original plan and purpose for your life. Today, we want to address you on the topic of destiny. It's one of those Uh, topics that uh, a lot of people have questions on how is destiny different from purpose and uh, how is destiny different from predestination and are they the, the same thing but being predestined is not the same thing as destiny and being predestined is a decision that God makes for you. Destiny is a decision that you make for yourself. And we want to make sure that your life is in total synchronization with God's original plan and purpose for your life. And this is why this series is important because destiny is determined by a decision. And we want to make sure that your decisions uh, that you are making are well informed, well prayed about and inspired by God himself. So let's pray. Our Father and our God, we give you praise and honor and glory. I decrease so that you may increase. Open up the heavens. Give us an open heaven so that we can operate under. Let there be no uh, uh, confusion in in, uh, translation. Let every man hear based on your original plan and intention for this message. Father, remove any confusion. Remove any demonic hijacking activities. Father, allow us to spend this time uh, excavating your word and being benefited because of your word. Your word, the entrance of the word, give it light. And no one needs to live in darkness. And we decree and declare, let there be light. Father, I pray that you would bless our time together and that as we uh, study uh, the whole aspect of of, of DNA, that you would give us uh, articulation of speech. You would allow us to be able to communicate even some complicated concepts and and just make them as simple so that a two-year-old could understand. I pray, Father, for those that are tuning in, those that are experiencing even 
setbacks. I pray, Father, that you would encourage them, those that are struggling in their lives for because of finances or abuse or addiction or loneliness. Father, those that are struggling with depression, those that are suicidal, those that are having marital uh, problems, those that are having parental issues. We pray, God, that you would meet them right where they are right now because with you, there is nothing that is impossible. I pray that you would encourage them. I pray, Father, that you would give them the ability to believe again, that when they slumber and sleep tonight, they would know that they, that they have a God that works the night shift too. Let things turn around. Let circumstances turn around. Let their health turn around. I pray for the one father that is struggling with their health. The one that is, has been uh, 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 on their bed believing, oh God, hallelujah, for a miracle. Those that are struggling with cancer, high blood pressure, low blood pressure. Hallelujah, I pray for divine intervention. I pray that you would heal them, that you would heal their minds, you would heal their body. Father, where the medication stops, where the pharmaceuticals stop, I decree that a miracle will begin right there. Father, we are, we are, we are joining our faith with that woman that is believing that their husband will be healed and their son will be healed and their daughter will be healed. We are standing in faith for the loved ones that are praying for their mother and praying for their father. Father, those that are struggling with incurable diseases. Let there be a miracle. Do what medicine cannot do. Do what pharmaceuticals cannot do. Do what doctors cannot do. Father, we are anticipating great testimonies. We are standing in faith for the one that has suffered loss. And we pray, oh God, there will be indemnification. Father, while they are going through their season of mourning and their season of grief, we know weeping endures for a night, but joy comes in the morning. Father, replace their mourning, hallelujah, with joy in the name of Jesus. Let them be able to go through one more day. Remove the insomnia. Remove the sleeplessness. Let them rest in you. You said you give your beloved sleep. Let them have the best sleep tonight in Jesus' name. Father, when they go home tonight, when they enter that door, hallelujah, let anxiety flee from their home. Let there be peace in their house. Remove the arguments. Remove the tension. Remove the fighting. Father, I pray that you would protect Protect that boy, that girl, that woman from any kind of abuse, mental abuse, physical abuse. Decree and declare. They are hidden in your secret place. They are protected today. Father, I pray, oh God, for healing. Hallelujah, that is coming from your sanctuary. Bless them indeed. Bless our time together. Give us the ability to focus. Let there be no distraction. We rebuke the one that is assigned as an agent of distraction. And I decree that they will be able to focus. We give you praise, oh God, for your anointing that will break yokes. I decree yokes are broken in your life right now for whom the Son sets free is free indeed. I decree you are free from drugs. You are free from addiction. You are free from suicide. You are free from torment. You are free from loneliness. You are free from disappointment. You are free from death. You are free from disease. I decree and declare freedom of your mind. I decree freedom to your marriage. Father, anything that is illegally bound, I decree that it will be loosed right now. I pray, Father, that you will loose, hallelujah, individuals that are bound right now. And Father, those that are backslidden, I pray, God, that they would be restored. Those that have lost their faith, I pray that their faith will be restored. Let tonight be a night of restoration. Everything that we have lost, loss, whether it's our home, whether it's a car, <coughs> whether it is a job, 
whether it is our faith, whether it is our joy, whether it is our peace, I decree and declare restoration right now in Jesus' name. Amen. If you believe it, put your hands together and shout, I believe it. <clears throat> Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We're very excited to uh, introduce you to our new uh, series entitled The DNA of Destiny. Now, when it comes to uh, the word destiny, uh, there's so much confusion what destiny is. But your destiny is where you end up tomorrow. That's what destiny is all about, where you end up tomorrow. <clears throat> One of the things that William Jennings um, Brian said... He said, destiny is, a matter of, is, is not a matter of chance. It is a choice. It is not a thing to be waited for. It's a thing to be achieved. So when it comes to this whole topic of destiny, the scripture that God gave, me, gave to me is found in the book of Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 19 to 20. And I'd love for you to go there with me, please. Deuteronomy chapter 30. 30, verse 19 to 20, <clears throat> and I'm going to read it. The scripture says, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that both thou and thy seed may live. So we know where you end up tomorrow is based on the decisions that you make today. So the bridge between your today and your tomorrow, that bridge can be found in decisions. The Bible said, verse number 20, that thou mayest love the Lord thy God, that thou mayest obey his voice, that thou mayest cleave unto him, for he is thy life and the length of thy days, that thou mayest dwell in the land which the Lord swear unto your father, to Abraham, to Isaac, and Jacob, to give them. Now, I thought this was in, in, very incredible. And when the Bible gives us indication that your destiny is directly um, uh, associated with the decisions that you make. That means that one of the things that you have to do is to take 100% responsibility for your life. It starts with that. It starts with that re re revelation that whatever happens to me, I am 100% responsible for that. Where I end up tomorrow, I will be 100% responsible for that. Now, a lot of people who are super spiritual might argue. They might say, well, it's all about God, and it's all about what God wants. But a part of that is true. A portion of that is true. But you have to choose to obey God. You see, it all boils down to choice and decisions. So if you are born again, that means that when you pray, you're going to seek his will. But it's a decision to pray. It's a decision to trust. It's a decision to rely on. Do you see that? Everything is about a decision that you make. So when you walk out of here and when you turn off your, your, your um, uh, computer and when this message is over, Unless you realize that life is going to happen based on a series of decisions that you make. It's going to happen based on a series of decisions that you make. And if you can get the decisions down, if you can get your decision-making skill down so that it's properly in alignment with how God originally planned and purposed you to live, then tomorrow does not have to be a mystery. Why? Because Jesus in John 10.10 10 says something. I have come that you may have life and have it more abundantly. Now that's a divine intention. God intends us to live an abundant life. It means that we should be living without lack. Now there's a difference between God supplying your need and God supplying your want. We can have wants all the way out the door, but God promised to supply our need. Now, Scripture says that you have to make a decision whether you want to live a blessed life, 
And we taught on living a blessed life or whether you want your life to be cursed. So let's settle once and for all what a blessing is and how to get the blessing and what a curse is and why some people end up cursed and why some people end up blessed and blessed. God said, I want you to make a decision. Here's your choice, life or death. What do you choose? There you go. Blessing or cursing, what do you choose? So that means that you have to make a decision to be blessed. It's, it's your decision. You see, we, we've got to move away from uh, believing that if your life is not working out, it's not working out because someone cursed you. Because the lady down the street wears a black hat and rides on a, 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 a wooden uh, a broom and, and she has a black cat. We, we have to move away from that, giving our personal power away from people who are working witchcraft. And my life is not working because someone cursed me. The scripture says in Proverbs, the curse causeless shall not come. So that means that a blessing, therefore, is the outcome of an act of obedience. And a curse is the natural outcome of an act of disobedience. So I'm going to float that as a balloon, and I'm going to come back to prove that, that particular uh, postulation. I'm going to prove it. So that means that every day you awaken, you could choose whether you're going to be blessed or whether you're going to be cursed. I choose to be blessed. What about you? I call to heaven and earth to record this day against you, that I have set options before you. You see, you cannot make a decision if there's no option. You've got to have two or more options in order to make a decision. So he said, I'm setting before you some options. Here's the option, blessing or curse. Uh, life or death. And he said that I want heaven and earth to record this. So that means that whenever you make a decision, heaven conspires with earth to bring the blessing. But if you make an alternative decision, then hell will conspire with earth to bring the outcome. Do you see that? If you choose life, heaven will conspire with, with earth to bring you the resources, the opportunities, the networks, the relationship, so that you're in the right place at the right time. Now, there are laws, there are spiritual laws that operate. If you do this, then here's the law. I'm going to give you an example, the law of Seed time harvest, the law of consequence, the law of giving and receiving. Let's use this. Two days ago, I took a colleague of mine to dinner. And there was this couple that was standing there. And I was paying for my meal, and I said, oh, uh, your meal is paid for. So just randomly, I paid for two people's meals. They were very excited. But I know what I was doing. Why? because I made a decision every single day to do something kind for someone, to give something to somebody, and to give it to people that could never repay the favor. So I do it every single day. I do a kind act every single day. Every single day of my life, I do a kind act. It's deliberate, why? Because what I'm activating is the law of giving and receiving, the law of seed time and harvest. So. I give them this particular uh, blessing. So what I really wanted to eat that night was meatloaf. And the chef came out and says, there's no more meatloaf. We ran out of meatloaf. I said, wonderful. I wanted this meatloaf so bad. So what I ordered was the fish. So I ended up with fish, uh, fish and shrimp. So I sat down to eat my meal. About 20 minutes later, the chef comes, and he brings me my own meatloaf. 
Then he comes back. And, he, and the lady gives me something else until I was piled up with food. Now, was it, was it just random? Did this just happen coincidentally? No. Why? I made a decision to do something that heaven had to conspire with what? Earth. To what? Bring me the result. And the result was a harvest. So anybody looking at me could say, you're lucky. And, and uh, uh, everybody in the restaurant and the chef favored you. But the chef had to favor me. Why? Because I did what? Activated a spiritual law. And I did it deliberately. So you don't have to go through life where life is just happening to you and you are responding to what's happening and then you end up exhausted with nothing to show for living on the earth realm. You can live this life deliberately and connect your future to your present by activating specific laws and doing it deliberately. Now, the Bible said... This is going to happen. And he said, I also swore to your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So that means that this covenant has been downloaded into our DNA. Because the father determines the DNA. I mean, it's a mixture of your mother and your father. Are you with me? But your father determines your gender. It's not the mother that determines it. Your father determines it, but he's also a contributor, a contributor to your DNA. So you have 23 chromosomes from your father, 23 chromosomes from your mother. And I was wondering why the Bible di didn't say, well, I swore this to Abraham and Sarah, Isaac and Rebecca and Jake. I, I, I swore this. He said, I just swore this to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And as I was meditating on this today, you are serving the God of Abraham. This is the God who is able to change your name. Because he was not always Abraham. He once was Abram. In other words, when God changed his name, he changed his brand. People began to see him from a different eye. They saw him as powerful. They saw him as influential. They no longer saw him as an immigrant. They saw him as a change agent. I'm going to tell you, you are serving a God who is able to rebrand you. And people that saw you one way is going to see you another way. People that looked down to you last season is going to look up to you this season. God is about to change your brand. Number two, the God of Isaac. That is the God who is able to change your destiny. And number three, the God of Jacob. The God who is able to change your nature. In this season, I am pronouncing the blessing of Abraham upon you. I am pronouncing the blessing of Isaac upon you. I I am pronouncing the blessing of Jacob. This is a season that God is going to rebrand you. You are going to be seen bigger than life. You are going to be seen as an influencer. You are going to be seen as an industry leader. You are going to be seen as a mover, a shaker, a history maker. You are going to be seen as an influencer. You are going to be seen as someone powerful. You are going to be seen as someone that is the head and not the tail. Someone that is first and not last. God is about to change your brand. Number two, God is about to alter your destiny. You were going one way. Your life was going in one direction. But God is going to shift your life until it's synchronized and syncopated with his original plan and purpose. 
<laughs> the mistakes that you made last year will not count for this year. The mistakes that you made in when you were 15 and 16 and 17 and 20 and 30 and 40, you are not going to have to live with the fallout of bad decisions. The years that the com palmer worm and the caterpillar destroyed and the canker worm destroyed, God is going to restore those years. I decree a season of second chances. You are going to have another chance. You are going to have another opportunity to do something great. You may have made mistakes last year, but they're not going to affect you this year. You may have said some things last year, but it's not going to affect you this year. In the name of Jesus, today is a destiny-altering, destiny-changing day for you, not just for you, for your marriage, not just for your marriage, for your finances. There are so many things that we did that we wish we had not done it, but I decree your beacon score will not affect what you do financially in the days to come. Your credit score will have no bearing because God is going to give you the ability to start right where you are. But at the end of this year, you are going to be in another place. Your money is going to be better. Your relationships are going to be better. Your business is going to be better. Your ministry is going to be better. Why? Because you are going to decide that is going to be better. You've got to accept the fact that where you live today, you decided to live there. Where you work today, you decided to work. Who you're married to, you decided. How much money you make, you decided. Your joy, you decided. If you take 100% responsibility for where you are right now, no matter how bad it is, no matter how ugly it is, no matter how pitiful it is, no matter how wretched it is, if you take responsibility, now we can have a conversation. But the moment you give up, <clears throat> your, your decision-making ability to someone else, you have made a decision to give, that, give that, that power away. So either way, you have made a decision. Now, what if you didn't make a decision? Well, you made a decision not to make the decision, so it's still a decision. <clears throat> the DNA of destiny. Life for so many people is a mystery. But I believe John 10:10, 10, 10, Jesus said, and it's a promise, that he came to give us life and to give us more abundantly. And if you're not a living the abundant life, then it, it can't be deacons or demons or devils. The box stops with you. The box stops with me. There's so many believers that are living beneath the standard that God intended for us, that God promised us. How many believers do you know? How many people do you know living beneath their standards? They got the capacity to live better, to be better. I know some people that have the capacity to be a doctor, but they're, they're, <clears throat> they're working right now as, as uh, janitors in a hospital. Now, there's nothing wrong with being a janitor. It's an honorable job. But they have the capacity to become a surgeon. But, but, but they're living beneath the standard that God has for them. So as we attack our subject matter today, I want to propose to you that there are 12 concepts every educated and spiritually mature person must know in order to be successful and to live a dynamic, prosperous, abundant life. These are 12. And I've been preaching this for the last uh, almost 20 years. There are 12, at least 15 years now. And I want to repeat it once again. Each one of these concepts, you have to be able to exert energy and push to understand them and then embrace them as very relevant for your life. These 12 concepts. Number one, you've got to understand where you came from. That speaks about your heritage. 
And I want to stop here. I, I've said this for 15 years, almost 20 years. I've said this. You did not come from an orangutan, a monkey, an ape. I don't care what anthropologists say. You came from God. That's your heritage. And before, before you were birthed into this three-dimensional world, this is very important. You had a relationship with God, and God had a relationship with you. This is what God said to the psalmist. Before you were formed in your mother's womb, I knew you. You know what that word know? It means to be intimate with. It has the connotation of you were already worshiping God before you were even born. So that means that, the, that the, from conception until you were birthed out, your birthday, you were worshiping God. That means when you came into this world, you were birthed as a worshiper. So somewhere along the line, you had to unlearn how to worship. That means worship is something that you do that is natural to you. It's in your DNA to worship God. It is not, it is not beyond our, our, con, our ability to conceive the fact that we were born worshipers. That means that when, when you go to church, it should be natural for you to worship. You don't need a worship leader to lead you into worship. Because you, in your DNA, your DNA, you're a worshiper. That means also you don't need to be in church to worship. That means everything that you do for God should be worship. It means whether or not you are in a physical building called a church, that, that how you live should constitute your worship. If one person's getting this, if I'm driving, I should be worshiping. If I'm typing on my computer, it should be worship. If I'm working, it should be done as unto the Lord. In other words, if I get hired by a client or by an employer, it's not, I'm not working for the employer. I'm working as unto the Lord. That means that whatever I do should be superior. Once you understand that you came from God and, 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 and that, that you worship God because that's a part of your heritage. It's a part of who you are. It's natural. It's unnatural for a person not to connect with their heritage. This is why when a country is destroyed and a person becomes, uh, goes to another country and they cannot return to their country, that means that, that everything about them is wiped out. They have no identity. They have no heritage. Why? Because they have nothing to connect to. So it's unnatural for us not to connect to God because that's where we came from. Where do you, where you come from? That's the important concept. Number two, what you were born into. Now, where you come from is your heritage. What you were born into is your inheritance. This is something that you didn't do. Somebody did it for you, prepared, prepared it for you, so that when you're in this world, you don't have to struggle like maybe they struggled. They're going to leave you something that you didn't qualify for. They're going to leave you something that you didn't have to pay for. That's why the scripture says a good man leaves an inheritance for his children's children. Now, you have your earthly father, but you also have your heavenly father. And he's a good father. That means that as a father, our God has left an inheritance for us. Come ye blessed of the Lord, inherit the kingdom prepared for you. So you're, a part of your inheritance is the kingdom. He didn't leave you a little small cabbage garden. He left you an entire kingdom. He didn't just leave you a community. He left you a kingdom. And that's a part of your inheritance. Number three, you've got to know where you come from. That's your heritage. What you were born in. That's your inheritance. You've got to know who you are. That's your identity. Your identity. And a lot of people are trying to be someone else. But you can't be someone else because all those other people are taken. So you can only be yourself. 
What is your identity? We are suffering from identity crisis. The church is suffering from an identity crisis. She doesn't know who she is anymore. That's the last thing that you should suffer from is an identity crisis. And this is why you have competition. There's nobody can be you. And you, you, don't, you shouldn't want to be someone else. You are, the best, you are the best individual that you can be. And be settled with being you. Now listen, I'm glad I'm me and not you. I like being me. I like the fact that I was made Cindy Trim. I don't want to be anybody else. You've got to know who you are. Know who you are, how God has made you, and know your identity in Christ Jesus. Number four, you got to know why you were born. That's your purpose. Number five, you, you got to know where you should be going. That's your destiny. Number six, you got to know how you plan to get there. That's your vision. Number seven, you've got to know what you should be doing when you get there. That's your assignment. You got to know how you're going to get, how you're going to do what you're going to do when you get there, and that's your strategy. You got to know when you should be doing it. That's timing. You got to know who you should be doing it with. That's relationships. You got to know with what you're going to be doing it. That's your resources. And then you got to know the fact that one day you're going to die. How is the next generation going to know that you did it? And that's your legacy. These are the 12 things that you've got to know. So today I can't focus on all 12, but I am going to focus on one, and that's number five, and that's destiny. Where are you going? Where are you going? That's your destiny. Now, when we talk about destiny, we are also talking about strategies that connect your present potential, your dreams, your vision to future realities. And you got to get this. We're talking about strategies, life strategies, that connects your potential, your dreams, your vision to future realities. Where? Does tomorrow come from? Is it chance? Is it random? Is it divine? Where does it come from? I mean, does God create your tomorrow? Or is it just happening randomly? Is it chance? If we could find this out, you can discover destiny. Luke chapter 15, let's turn there. Let's start at verse number 11. Talk about destiny, destiny. The Bible said, and he said, a certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he divided unto them his living. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, took his journey to a far country, and there wasted his substance with riotous living. When he had spent all, there arose a famine in the land. He began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country. And he sent him, or the citizen sent him, into the field to feed the swine. So let's stop here right now. How did he end up in a pig pan? How? How did he end up? The Bible said the citizen sent him into the fee fields to feed the swine. So how did he end up feeding swine? How did he end up feeding the swine? He gave, thank you, he gave his personal power away to someone who said, this is as good as it gets. You're not worth anything more. You, you don't have the qualifications to be a supervisor. You don't have the qualifications to be a manager. You don't have the qualification to be a jeweler. You don't have the qualifications. The only thing that you're good for right now is sweeting, feeding swine. But hold on a minute. He's a Jew. And Jews don't do pigs. It's against their custom. To touch a pig. So how did he sink so low? Was it the economy? 
Was it the fact that there were no more jobs? So the only job in, in his industry was the worst job? I am decreeing and declaring this is the last season that you will work for the, in, in the worst jobs in your industry. From today onward, you're going to work in the best jobs in your industry. If you're going to be in the industry, you're going to have the best jobs. You're going to. And how is that going to happen? Because you're going to decide to. Nobody can tell you how much you are worth and how much you are going to earn. Nobody in this world. You see, you earn what you earn because you decided to accept that paycheck. Now, they offered it to you. You didn't have to accept it. But you made a decision to accept that paycheck. So that means what you earned was a decision that you made. Because you don't have to take the offer. The prodigal son could have said, I don't do pigs. Bye. But what did he do? He made a decision to what? Accept it. Because he had an option. His option was handle pigs or go somewhere else. And he made a decision to sink as low as he did. Do you see that? Now watch this. The Bible said he would have fain filled his belly. This is verse number 16 with the husk that the swine did eat. No man gave unto him. Number 17. And when he came to himself, he said, hold on one minute. So he comes to himself. Where was he before he came to himself? It means that he left the decision for his future in someone else's hand. And it was a decision that he made. Then he decided, hold on one minute. I'm better than this. What was I thinking? In other words, I was not thinking like myself. Have you ever been to a place where you just didn't feel yourself? I have. This is not me. Where you do things that are what? Beneath you. You could do better. But now you have slipped into a state where you're doing things that are beneath you. You know you deserve better. You know you deserve to live in a better place. You, know you deserve to be treated better. You deserve to have a better position. But why? People with less qualifications are living better, doing better. They got better jobs. But look at you. And you just accept it as a way of life. Well, the devil could go to hell because I'm coming to my senses. It's a revelation. You don't have to accept the state that you're in. You don't have to accept the treatment that people give you. You don't have to accept earning what you're earning. You can earn more. It's your decision. It is not the government's decision. It is not your boss's decision. It is your decision. How much are you worth? How much do you want to earn? Where do you want to live? Decisions. He said, hold on one minute. How many hired servants of my father have bread enough to spare and I perish with hunger? Hold on, I got options. I don't have to be here doing things that are beneath me. I have options. The moment you recognize that you live in a world of unlimited possibility and potentiality, that you don't have to compete with anyone. This is the first lesson I learned of success and prosperity. The first lesson I learned of success and prosperity is there's a world filled with unlimited resources, unlimited opportunities, unlimited positions, unlimited. It's unlimited. Why do I want to compete with others when I've got unlimited possibilities and potential? I really do. So if someone is competing with you, never compete with them. Just take a step back because what's for you is for you. They are wasting their energies. 
They'll never get your blessing. So let them compete with you, but never compete with anybody else. Always be happy for someone's blessings. Why? Because there's more out there for you. There's a whole lot more from where that came from. And you never have to be jealous. And you never have to be resentful. And you never have to be envious. Are you hearing me? You never. I bless God you're driving in a Rolls Royce. But there's millions of Rolls Royce sitting out there parked with my name on it. I'm just going to claim one. Are you with me? It doesn't have to be a Rolls Royce. Could be a job. You don't have to compete to occupy someone else's space. God has a space for you in the realm of success and prosperity. Occupy your space. He said, hold on one minute. I've got options. He said, my dad has enough food for the employees, and I'm sitting here perishing with hunger. Verse number 18, I will arise. This is the law of intention. I will arise. Arise means to operate at a, in a higher plane. It means that he had sunk so low that he was living beneath who he should be. And he had settled for a while. He had settled. I decree and declare you would not settle. If God has 10 for you, I decree you will not settle at a 5. If God has 50 for you, I decree that you will not settle with 10. No more settling. You're going to go for broke. Amen. So he said, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee. In other words, I've sinned against heaven and earth. It was uh, Moses that said, he said, I'm calling heaven and earth to be a witness. And I'm, I, I'm giving you the revelation. That your future blessings is your choice. Your future curse is your choice. Future life is your choice. Future death is your choice. And I'm setting this into motion. In other words, whatever decision you make is either going to activate the blessing or it's going to activate the curse. It's going to activate life or it's going to activate death. And it's going to be connected to your decisions. Now, a decision to act requires intention. Have you ever invited people to church and they say, I'm, I try, and that Sunday you look for them and they're not there? It means the word I'll try means I have no intentions. So when people say, I'm going to try, I'm going to try to do this, it means I have no intentions to finish it. It means that I'm going to have an excuse, I'm going to find an alibi, but I'm not going to do it. Here is rule number one, principle number one. You will never, ever accomplish anything or succeed at anything that you try. You got to do. I'm going to do it. It's a decision. I'm going to do it. He said, I will arise, go to my father's house. I will say unto him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before thee, sinned against two realms, heaven and earth. And I am no more worthy to be called your son. Make me one of your hired servants. And he arose. He did what he said. A lot of us break covenant with ourselves. And we train ourselves not to take ourselves serious. So your brain just does not shift into gear. Your eyes don't look for opportunities. Your hands are not productive. It doesn't start anything. Your feet never go anywhere because your brain says she's not serious. The last time she said that, she never did anything, so let's not expend the energy. Let's not help her. Let's not give her insight. Opportunities will come, but she's going to be blind to the opportunities because she's not serious. He's not serious. So let's just start with something very simple. I'm going on a diet. When are you going? Tomorrow. When you open your eyes, you better not be eating Twinkies for breakfast. The night before, you're going to go into your refrigerator. You're going to get rid of anything that is not diet specific. You're going to go in your uh, cabinet, 
and you're gonna take out all the potato chips, all the candies, all the chocolates, you're gonna give them away. You're gonna take out all the sugary drinks, you're gonna give it away. In your refrigerator, there's gonna be water. You're gonna have fruits, you're gonna stack it up with fruits and vegetables. See, your intention dictates to your activities. So if you find out your activities are contrary to your intentions, you never intended it anyway. You were just lying to yourself. You were deceiving yourself. The worst deception is self-deception. He said, I got up, I went to my father's house. He said that my father saw me afar off. He ran to greet me with compassion. I fell on his neck. I kissed him. Then the he, I confessed. I took 100% responsibility for my action. Watch this, verse number 21. And the son said unto his father, Father, I've sinned against heaven, and in thy sight I'm no more worthy to be called your son. In other words, I take 100% responsibility for what I did. I didn't blame it on the economy. I didn't blame it on the guy that said this is the only job you're going to work at. I just take 100% responsibility. I'm not looking for an alibi. I didn't feel sick. It wasn't my friends. I wasn't around the wrong crowd. Because sometimes the wrong crowd is you. Medea said, I could do bad all by myself. So some of you, you don't need help. Can I get a show you right? Because the church ain't going to say amen. But the father said to his servants, bring the best robe, put it on, his, on him, bring the ring, put it on his hands, shoes on his feet, and bring the fetid cow. Then he said, for this my son, verse number 24, was once dead and is alive again. He was once lost and is found. In other words, he lost connection with who he really was. Now he's finally decided to reconnect with it to his heritage and to his inheritance. There's a statement that was made by this philosopher, and I want to give this statement to you. The day that you were born, you were given two proverbial envelopes. On the front of one was written incredible pleasure, success, vibrant health, and prosperity. On the other was written incredible pain, failure, disease, and poverty. Two envelopes. When you opened each envelope, they both had a blank page. We call these pages destiny. And you get to choose which category of page you will write on every single day. Because life happens to you one day at a time. The prodigal son is a story that depicts destiny. We learn several things from this story. Number one, at the very moment a decision is made, destiny is born. Number two, destiny is decision-oriented. This means that you have to have superior decision-making skills and strategies. Number three, your destiny is being experienced, engineered, and altered on a moment-by-moment -moment basis. So that means that if you make a decision today and it's leading you this way, and the next moment you make a decision, you are actually altering where you end up tomorrow. So that means that you cannot just go through life in neutral. You've got to live life intentionally, and you've got to live it deliberately. Once you give your life to God, he enlightens your spirit to discern his will so that you will know the geography of your destiny. He will give you an amazing decision-making ability. Deuteronomy 8, 6 to 17, amazing. It says, therefore, thou shalt keep the commandments of the Lord thy God to walk in his ways and to fear him. For the Lord thy God bringeth thee into a good land, a land of brooks, of waters, of fountains, of depths that spring out of the valleys and hills, a land of wheat and barley and vines and fig trees and pomegranates, a land of oil and olive and honey. This is unlimited resources. This world is 
filled with unlimited resources. And if you listen to the economist, you will feel as if somehow the reservoir of resources is drying up and you're only limited to this amount, but it's not true. The same amount of money and resources that was around during Solomon's days is still here. The same amount of capital. There are 12 forms of capital. That means money is only one form. And if you don't have money, you've got another 11 forms of capital that you can use. And the thing is, a lot of us limit our lives to the money that we make when there is unlimited resources made available to you for you to succeed, for you to prosper. But you just have to have your eyes open to understand that this is available to me as well. It's not available just for the people that were born with silver spoons in their mouths and gold spoons in their mouths. It's there for all of us. Why? Because God created this world for us to live in. It does not belong to the devil. It belongs to God. God said, I'm taking you to a land, verse number nine, nine we're in. Thou shalt eat bread without scarceness. Thou shalt not lack anything in it. A land whose stones are iron and out of whose hills thou mayest dig brass. When thou hast eaten and art full, then thou shalt bless the Lord thy God for the good land which he hath given thee. Beware that thou forget not the Lord your God in not keeping his commandments and his judgment and his statutes which I commend thee this day. Lest when thou hast eaten and art full and has built goodly houses and dwelt therein. Hold on one minute. Hold on. You didn't get this? He said, when you have eaten and are full, your days of hunger are over. Your days of scarcity are over. He didn't say if you eat. He said when you eat. You are going to eat and you are going to have no lack. That is a promise that God has made. He said when you have built Goodly houses. You know what a goodly house is? A goodly house is not a condo. Your condo is your vacation home. He said, you're going to build mansions. That's what a goodly house is. You're going from small to big. And if you live in a condo, it's because you want to. Are you hearing me? I'm going to say it again. If you live in an apartment, it is because you chose to. Not because you have to. You chose to. Are you getting it? You are not limited. He said you build goodly houses and dwell therein. Is the word house or houses? Is it, is it single or plural? It means that you're going to have a mansion in, 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 in uh, 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 New York. You're going to have a, 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 a vacation home in Florida. You're going to have a, a, a vacation home in London. You're going to have one in Switzerland, and you're not going to have to rent it out to pay the mortgage. In other words, you're going to have more than enough. You're going to own the house, and you're going to be able to pay for the upkeep of the house. People build houses, but they don't live in it because they can't afford the mortgage. But that's not going to be you. You better say amen. I don't know if you're in a state of shock or what, but this is the word of God. I'm going to eat and I'm going to be full. I'm going to build godly houses, not just buy them. I'm going to build them. Glory to God. And then I'm not going to have to rent them out. I'm just going to close them up. I'm going to hire a housekeeper, a groundsman. Keep the house until I come back. And call them. I'll be there next week. Get the house ready. Yes, Glory to God. I'm all charged up now. And when thy herds and flocks multiply, we don't have no cows and ox today. We don't have horses. We have horsepower. You're going to get this tomorrow. And it's plural. You're not going to have to share your car with your wife. Share your car with your son. Where's your car? Oh, my son has it. I can't come to church tonight because my son had to pay basketball and he has the car. 
Your son will have a car. Your daughter will have a car. Your husband will have a car. You will have a car. <laughs> he said, and your silver and gold is multiplied. I like that. You got a, a massive, impressive investment portfolio. Stocks, bonds, futures. <laughs> and they're multiplied. He said, then thy heart is lifted up and forget the Lord thy God, which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage, who led thee through the great and terrible wilderness, wherein were fiery serpents and scorpions and drought, where there was no water, who brought thee forth water out of the rock of the flint, who fed thee in the wilderness with manna. Your wilderness days are over. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. God has a promised land for you. He said, which your fathers knew not that he may humble thee, that he might prove thee to do thee good at the letter end. This is your letter end. Your days of being tested are over. You have qualified. You're going into the promised land. I qualified. After all you've been through, you're going to come out more than with, with just a T-shirt. Mm -hmm. And he said, and, and thou say in thy heart, my power and my might of my own hand had gotten me this wealth. But thou shalt remember the Lord thy God. For it is he that giveth thee power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant, which he swear unto thy father as it is this day. One of the powers that God gives you, he gives you intellectual power. Are you with me? He gives you the capacity. And when you understand that you're thinking too small, you could pray the prayer of Jabez. Father, enlarge my territory. I'm thinking too small. I've got too many lids. I've got too many limitations on me. Father, I decree and declare you are enlarging my capacity. I decree and declare your days of thinking small are over. Your days of lids and limitation are over. Your days of living with barriers are over. I decree and declare whom the sun sets free is free indeed. No more lids. No more limitation. No more barriers. In Jesus' name I pray. The Bible said in 3 John 1 and 2, Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health. Even as your soul prospers, you got to understand that God wants to give you the insight. He wants to give you the ability. He wants to give you life strategies. He wants to give you decision-making strategies so that you can decide to move into the realm that God has prepared for you. But many of us are not living in that realm, the realm that God originally purposed for us to live. He created us for wealth. He did not create us for power. He did not create us for lack. There is nothing in our DNA, hallelujah, that's dictating to lack. Everything about us is dictating for more. How do we know it? Because you are not satisfied with what you have. You are not satisfied with what you are doing. It's almost as if there is an itch that cannot be scratched and you cannot articulate. You know that there's got to be something more. And this is why you are praying. Many people are afraid of the word wealth. They're afraid of the word prosperity. And I don't know why, especially if God says that I give you the power to get wealth. I give you the ability to prosper. I was, I was in London recently, and I had a conversation with my chauffeur, and we were driving just out of London, and we were talking about uh, rich, and he adamantly stated that he never wanted to be wealthy. He just wanted to be comfortable. And he, 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 his, rational, his, his rationale was irrational to me. And I asked him, why would you say that? He said, wealthy people are snooty. Wealthy people are arrogant. Wealthy people are mean. And I said, wow. And I countered his argument. I said, you haven't met every wealthy person in the earth. 
you know, and I told him, I said, your sentiment is unfair and it's prejudice. And that struck a nerve and he was vehement and he began to argue with me. And he said, I'm sorry, ma'am. This is the first time I'm arguing. I said, that's okay. And I began to explain to him, maybe it's because you ran into wealthy people and you associated, hallelujah, wealth with someone that was arrogant and someone that was mean, but they were always arrogant. They were always mean but they just have the money to be meaner and more arrogant. But money doesn't change a person. I said, money doesn't change you. If you are humble without money, you will be humble with money. But there are some people that where, where you say, well, money changed her. No money didn't change her. She was always like that, but she just didn't have enough money to do it. Money will not change you. Wealth will not change you. It will only make you more of who you are. That means if you're stingy with a dollar, you're going to be stingy with ten dollars. You're going to be stingy with a hundred dollars. It means that if you give God uh, hallelujah your best when you have a dollar, you're going to give him your best when you have ten dollars. You're going to give him your best when you have a hundred dollars. Let me tell you, money doesn't change who you are. It just highlights who you are. There were so many believers hallelujah that feel the same way as this gentleman. I just want to be confident, com comfortable, but I believe it's because they have a misunderstanding of what wealth really is. God said that I'm going to, hallelujah, give you the power to get wealth. Now, your decision is this. Whether you want to be wealthy or not is your decision, but I want to explain something to you so that you can walk away with a working definition of what wealth is. Wealth is the plentiful supply of resources that increases the quality of life and the probability of securing a trust for the future generations to enjoy, to explain, to uh, exploit. In other words, you will live comfortably in your life, but you have enough to leave over as an inheritance for your children's children. Wealth, uh, wealth building is not relegated to the simple acquisition of money. Although it empowers one to acquire money or more money and things that will further increase the quality of your life. But wealth is a state of being. One has to have wealth in their heart and wealth in their head and wealth in their soul before they have wealth in their hands. Wealth is an inclusive word. Wealth is something that God empowers us to do, that gives gives us the competitive edge. It is an all-encompassing word. Wealth is the ability to take money and convert it into capital. In other words, most people spend their money, but they don't see money as capital. The Bible talks about capital in the form of seed. God gives you seed money. In other words, as long as you spend it, it is not considered seed. But when you are able to take money and invest it, it is is considered seed or capital. The Bible indicates that God will give seed to the sower. You've got to be able to change your perception of how you view money. Money is not there just for you to exchange it for things, but money should be there for you to build wealth so that you can advance the kingdom so that you can leave an inheritance for your children's children. In other words, you've got to be able to take the money and you've got to and be able to leverage it and you've got to be able to have an ROI. I decree and declare your days of just spending is over. Unless there's an ROI I decree and declare you are changing right now. Hallelujah. How you look at money and your decisions for how you are spending it. I decree your days of rubbing Peter to pay Paul is over. Your days of scratching where you don't eat it is over once you understand that God has given you power to get wealth, you are going to make a different kind of financial decisions. I decree that your decisions uh, are going to be made not for immediate gratification, but you're going to be thinking about your future and what you can invest in so that when you get to your future, you've got something to show for the 40 years of working, the 50 years of working. I decree and declare that you 
will be able to retire. And in your retirement, you'll be able to do the work of the Lord without worrying how you're going to eat and how you're going to have a roof over your head. I decree your days of worrying about money is over. Wealth is abundance. And a lot of times when we talk about abundance, we only look myoptically and we only talk about abundant money. But what about abundant health? What about abundant joy? What about abundant freedom? What about abundant family life? What about abundant friendship? What about abundant happiness? What about abundance of health? What about an abundance of knowledge? What about abundance of learning? What about an abundance of love? What about an abundance of peace? What about abundance of purpose? What about abundance of riches? What about an abundance in your salvation? You don't have to limit your abundance to money. There is more in store than just you scrunching around trying to make another dollar without realizing that there are so many people that don't have happy homes. But if you have happiness in your home, if you can go home and you have a home that is your haven, you are wealthy. There are so many people that cannot sleep at night because of the confusion in your home. But when you go home, if you have peace, if you have a loving spouse, if you have a loving children, if you have celebration, you may not have everything temporal that you want, but if you've got peace, if you can go to sleep at night, you are wealthy. Let's talk about wealth. Wealth is access to and the ability to convert natural resources into commodities, goods, and products. How many of you are entrepreneurs and you have the ability to take an idea and create a product and take it to the marketplace? Not many people have that skill, but if you could take an idea and then if you can uh, uh, form the idea and turn it into a product, a good and service that other people buy, you are wealthy. You are wealthy if you've got intellectual property that people buy, if you've got influence, if you've got creativity, if you've got innovative skills, if you've got problem solving skills, if you've got transition skills. You are wealthy if you live in a culture of empowerment. You are wealthy if you've got wisdom. You are wealthy if you've got respect. You are wealthy if you've got love. You are wealthy if you've got status. You are wealthy if you have favor with God and man. You are wealthy if you're anointed. You are wealthy if you've got the gifts of the Spirit. You are wealthy if you've got the fruit of the Spirit. You are wealthy if you have a unshakable faith. You are wealthy. If you have a mastermind group, you are wealthy. If you have a personal brand, you are wealthy. If you have a PR and marketing strategy, you are wealthy. If you have business relationship, you are wealthy. If you have banking relationship, you are wealthy. If you have legal counsel, you are wealthy. If you have angel investors, you are wealthy. If you have signed contracts, you are wealthy. If you have funding, you are wealthy. If you have interest-free loans. You are wealthy. If you've got seed money, you are wealthy. If you've got an accountant, you are wealthy. If you've got trade secrets, you are wealthy. If you have legal tax haven, you are wealthy. If you've got formulas and recipes, you are wealthy. If you've got tax strategies, you are wealthy. If you've got investments, you are wealthy. If you have a good name, you are wealthy. If you have a good reputation, you are wealthy. If you have unlimited lines of credit, you are wealthy. If you have a global network, you are wealthy. If you have financial acumen, you are wealthy. If you have opportunities, God said you should not forget that God bless you with this but thou shalt remember the name of the Lord our God for it is he that gives you power to get wealth. Shout I'm wealthy. I'm wealthy. Now prayerfully I've convinced you that you've got what it takes to live an abundant, a successful, a prosperous life. Now that we know that you've got everything that you need, now it's time for you to start making decisions accordingly. If you don't like where you are, 
decide to be somewhere else in the future. If you don't like what you're earning, decide to earn something else in your future. If you don't like who you live with, decide to live with somebody different. You don't have to stay with that roommate that gets on your last nerve. You don't like the car you're driving, decide. If you don't like the couch that you sit on, don't complain about it. Go out, decide on the couch that you want. You are not relegated to live like you live, to live how you live, to live where you live. If you discern that this is not God's best for you, you are not a prisoner of war. You are a prisoner of your thoughts. The moment your thoughts change, your life will change accordingly. Because as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Our Father and our God will give you praise and honor and glory as we introduce this topic. And we lay the foundation for the discussions that we will have over the next few weeks as we talk about destiny. Destiny is where we end up, where we end up tomorrow. You are the one that knows the terrain that we have to navigate to get from where we are to where we need to be in the days to come. We are trusting you to lead us. You've downloaded our map into our soul. You downloaded it the day that we were conceived. It was David that said, marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knows right well. So we know that our soul knows the map for our future. Ecclesiastes states, very simple, that you have made everything beautiful in his time. You have set the world in our hearts. So, Father, we know that we need to start here. We know that destiny shows up as an inner prompting. It's the wooing of the Holy Spirit. It's that still small voice. Therefore, we can trust you to direct us. We can trust you so that we are able to navigate the blueprint that you have placed in our spirit and our soul and construct the life of our dreams. We know that the Holy Spirit's job is to upload what you have downloaded. So Holy Spirit, Upload it. Give us daydreams. Give, give us night dreams. Let us dream at night. Speak to us. Show us the way. Father, teach us how to learn to listen to the voice of your spirit. Because when we do, he will lead us where we need to go. He would teach us decision-making strategies when we have options before us. We'll be able to make them quickly. These options will be dictated to by our vision. Father, you told Abraham that you would take him to a land that he would, that you would show him. And he was obedient and he got up and he began to follow the prompting. And there were a series of events that happened that nudged him along, prompted him. We know that we don't have to be saddled with just a destiny. That we can have a divine destiny. And we thank you, Father, that you are synchronizing and syncopating us right now with heaven's rhythm. Let your will be done in our lives. We give you the praise and the honor and the glory. Let us just start where we are without the need to looking back with regrets. Because we cannot start with where we are not. We can only start with where we are. And then give us a vision of where we should be. And then, Father, we know that life happens. And every day we have to choose what we pay attention to, what we give our time to, who we give our time to. We have to make a decision whether we answer the phone call or we answer emails. We have to make a decision on how we solve our problems. And we make a decision every day. We make decisions about what we would eat. We make decisions about where we would drive. We make decisions about entertainment. We make decisions about relationships. We're making decisions every single day. 
Help us to be more intentional, more deliberate. Help us to be more conscious about the decisions that we are making. For thine is the kingdom, thine is the power, thine is the glory forever and ever. Amen. Were you blessed with this? Put your hands together. Amen. God is good, amen? Well, thank you for joining us online. And as I sat back there listening to Dr. Trim, I just reminisced about the first time I heard her speak. And something on the inside of me came to life. And that's the message of the kingdom. Something that cannot be described, but you know there's more to life. There's more to living. There's more to going to work every single day. You know that gnawing feeling. And tonight you heard a sound that you connected to, that resonated on the inside of you. It's very similar to, to what Mary was feeling when the Holy Spirit came upon her. And, and a seed was deposited in her. That which could not be understood by the community around her. And she had to step out of her people for a season and meet with a distant cousin named Elizabeth. And the Bible says that when they came together, the baby leapt on the inside of them because they were carrying the same destiny DNA. I believe that you're connected to this ministry. And I want to highly recommend for you to join us in July at Kingdom School of Ministry for a week long, yes, for a week long ministry intensive. You get to spend a week and we're gonna give you the articulation for that feeling on the inside of you. And we're gonna help you build a pathway to fulfilling purpose. And we're gonna help you link together the decisions necessary for you to get from point A to point Z. And we're gonna give you the strategies that you need through eight power packed courses, understanding the kingdom, prayer and spiritual warfare, prophets and prophecy, un, uh, understanding the kingdom and kingdom economics and biblical finances. You've got to be there. So register now. Don't hesitate, but I want you to hit that registration button. It's in the comment section above, and it's also right there. If you're on our website, you can hit our events section. You'll be able to register right now. Spend a week with us in July. You won't regret it. I promise you, my life was forever changed, and I know yours will be as well. We also want to give you the opportunity to partner with us, both through, through prayer and financially. Hit that give button now and sow a seed today that'll go into your future harvest. We believe it's going to return to you a hundredfold. We speak a blessing over you tonight. and we'll